parents and teachers told them were true, but perhaps never fully believed themselves. More than anything, this book is for those young people, an invitation to once again remake the world and to bring about through hard work, determination, and a big dose of imagination. An America that finally aligns with all that is best in us. August 2020. Part one, the bank. Chapter one. Of all the rooms and halls and landmarks that make up the White House speech grounds, is the West Colonnade that I love best. For eight years, that walkway would frame my day. A minute long, open air commute from home to office and back again. It was where each morning I felt the first slap of winter wind or pulse of summer heat. A place where I'd gather my thoughts, taking through the meetings that lay ahead, preparing arguments for skeptical members of Congress or anxious constituents, girding myself for this decision or that slow rolling crisis. In the earliest days of the White House, the executive offices and the first family's residence fit under one roof, and the West Colonnade was little more than a path to the horse stables. But when Teddy Roosevelt came into office, he determined that a single building couldn't accommodate a modern staff, six boisterous children, and his sanity. He ordered the construction of what would become the West Wing and Oval Office. And over decades and successive presidencies, the Colonnade's current configuration emerged, a bracket to the Rose Garden north and west. The thick wall on the north side, mute and unadorned save for high half-moon windows, the stately white columns on the west side, like an honor guard, ensuring a safe passage. As a general rule, I'm a slow walker, a Hawaiian walk, Michelle likes to say, sometimes with a hint of impatience. I walk differently, though, on the column, conscious of the history that had been made there and those would proceed. My stride got longer, my steps a bit brisker, my footfall on stone echoed by the Secret Service detail trailing me a few yards back. When I reached the ramp at the end of the colonnade, the legacy of FDR in his wheelchair, I picture him smiling, chin out, cigarette holder clenched tight in his teeth as he strains to roll up the incline. I'd wave at the uniformed guard just inside the glass pane door. Sometimes the guard would be holding back a surprised flock of visitors. If I had time, I would shake their hands and ask where they were from. Usually, though, I just turned left, following the outer wall of the cabinet room and slipping into the side door by the Oval Office, where I greeted my personal staff, grabbed my schedule and a cup of hot tea, and started the business of the day. Several times a week, I would step out onto the colonnade to find the groundskeepers, all employees of the National Park Service working in the Rose Garden. They were older men, mostly, dressed in green khaki uniforms, sometimes matched with a floppy hat to block the sun, or a bulky coat against the cold. If I wasn't running late, I might stop to compliment them on the fresh plantings, or ask about the damage done by the previous night's storm, and they'd explain their work with quiet pride. They were men of few words, even with one another. They made their points with a gesture or a nod. Each of them focused on his individual task, but all of them moving with a synchronized grace. One of the oldest was Ed Thomas, a tall, wiry black man with sunken cheeks who had worked at the White House for 40 years. The first time I met him, he reached into his back pocket for a cloth to wipe off the dirt before shaking my hand. His hand, thick with veins and knots like the roots of a tree, engulfed mine. I asked how much longer he intended to stay at the White House before taking his retirement. I don't know, Mr. President, he said. I like to work. Get a little hard on the joints, but I reckon I might stay as long as you're here. Make sure the garden looks good. Oh, how good that garden looked. The shady magnolias rising high at each corner. The hedges thick and rich green. The crab apple trees pruned just so. And the flowers, cultivated in greenhouses a few miles away, providing a constant explosion of color. Reds and yellows, pinks and purples. In spring, the tulips massed in bunches, their heads tilted toward the sun. In summer, lavender heliotrope and geraniums and lilies. In fall, chrysanthemums and daisies and wildflowers.